All right, so um, let's start. The main reminder for me was to turn on the screencast, which I did. Um, a reminder for you is that I should have office hours tomorrow from 11 to 2. Um, I didn't get jury duty today, but they said I have to call again tomorrow to find out. So um, hopefully I won't have jury duty tomorrow. If I do, I'll be completely gone all day long, unless I get out of it at some point. So I'll send an email to the list with an update as soon as I find out. Um, okay, so that's that. And what we're doing right now is talking about graphics in Sage, 2D and 3D graphics. And um, remember the overview of what's available is 2D plotting that's a lot like Mathematica's 2D plotting, data-oriented 2D plotting that's very much like MATLAB's 2D plotting, and 3D plotting that again is somewhat like Mathematica's 3D plotting. And these are the things we're going to talk about. I um, guided you through about half, literally in alphabetical order, of um, the plotting, the 2D plotting before, and we're going to pick up where we left off um, on 2D plotting and finish talking about Sage's sort of native 2D plotting, and then we'll talk about um, PyLab, which provides 2D plotting that's like MATLAB. And then when we're done with that um, on Friday, if I'm here, which I hope to be, then we'll talk about 3D plotting, okay? And there's actually quite a lot of uh, 3D plotting capabilities in Sage. Um, pretty powerful, so there's a lot to talk about there. Um, by the way, remember how I had to explicitly give the fixed size option every time I made a plot so that the result didn't look very large? Um, it turns out that right now, uh, it used to be there, there was a um, variable you could say sage.plot.plot.fixsize, default fixed size, and just set it, and then that would set the fixed size. Um, but somebody removed that. And, um, and currently what you can do is explicitly import matplotlib and then set something called RC params as given to something and then that will be the new default for the figure size. So currently that's something that will work and that's what I'll do for the rest of today. So now I don't have to explicitly say fig size to avoid an, a potentially enormous figure. And just so you can see another issue I mentioned was that when I was showing you SVGs, they tended to look a lot better than the PNG images. Um, they should look about the same if I don't zoom in at all. Um, so <coughs> these should probably look about the same. Here this is at a zero zoom level, i.e. the default zoom level. Typically when I'm giving a talk or a presentation, I'll zoom in a bit so you can see the text better, i.e. I'll do this. Um, so if you look at these two, after I've zoomed in, the PNG, of course, also gets zoomed in. The fonts are nice and big, but when the PNG zooms in, it starts to look fuzzy, like the letters look fuzzy and so on. Whereas the SVG just scales up, so it doesn't look fuzzy at all. So that's what's going on there. So um, if you're using the default zoom in your browser, then the PNG should look pretty, should look just as good as the SVG. Like that. Okay, so that's the difference. Um, all right, so now let's literally pick up where we left off. Um, I think the last thing we talked about or started to talk about was the polygon command. Um, I very briefly mentioned the text command, and then uh, we were done. Um, the polygon command draws a polygon. It doesn't have to be a convex polygon. All you do is you give a list of points, and it draws lines between them, just like the uh, line command, and it closes it up in that um, two zero, that's the last point right here, but then it draws an additional line back to where you started, and by default it fills it in, so you get a filled polygon. So if your points cut out a convex filled polygon, then there's sort of no uh, ambiguity at all with, about what's going on. You can also say fill equals false and make a polygon, and it won't fill in the inside. Sometimes what you'll want to do is make a polygon where the inside is filled in in one color and the outside now I'll zoom, making it uglier so you can see better. The outside is drawn in a different color, and um, I think the only way to do that is to just draw the polygon twice, once with fill equal to false and once with fill equal to true. Um, one time you draw it, it'll draw the, fill, the inside. The other time it'll draw the border around the outside. Um, given the somewhat random nature in which things are on top of other things, it's probably a good idea to um, use the Z order option like this to ensure that 
the inside is underneath the outside. Like that. Um, if we switch them around and made the z order uh, for the inside really big, then uh, apparently that doesn't do what you'd think. Hmm. Ah, because of the thickness, I see. I guess if the thickness were zero, but that's kind of silly. Um, so maybe half of, maybe a little tiny, yeah, little tiny bits there. Now if I make it minus one, you should see a little more. Yeah. So in fact, half of the line gets covered when you, if you set z order equal to something positive, bigger than one, so that the filled polygon is on top, then half of the line that's around the outside is covered, and the other half isn't. So, and the, li the line has some thickness, so it kind of gets covered. It's like one, I guess it's a half in each direction. So um, possibly watch out for that if you're trying to do that. Um, here's an example of a just a random polygon. It'll look different each time I do this. And um, here I just computed 100 points in order, in some random order, and then asked for the polygon that goes through them. And this is the terrifying looking thing that I got. So don't say about it, but there it is. Apparently it does something. Um, I'm not sure what the semantics are when, let's see, let's just try an example that is a little clearer to determine what the semantics are. So, well, this one is just one single polygon. So, um, if they overlap, then it's just, it's pretty clear what happens. It just um, puts one on top of the other, depending on the Z order, or random if you don't give a Z order. Um, so, the question is if you have a polygon, and then it kind of cuts through itself. So, let's make a polygon that cuts through itself somehow. So, uh, that's a good example of that. So, we can make a polygon that looks like this, I guess. Pretty clear what that's going to do. Uh, wow, we, have to, we need a lot of points. Okay. That's a lot of points. Um, we could do. Yeah. That's what I should do. Make a triangle like that, and then a triangle inside of it. That's pretty easy. And so all I have to do is take this one that we already have and uh, make it go back to the beginning, 0, comma, 1. And now I'm going to make it just go in again um, from the starting point to 1, comma, instead of 1, comma, 1, how about 1, comma, 0.8? And then have it go down a little 1.6, and then back. Then it'll always go back to the starting point. So it looks like it just, just on top of itself. So it just draws it on again. If you do fill equals, maybe as a double check, let's do fill equals false, so we can see that it it's like that. So um, if you draw a polygon on and it goes on top of itself again, it just not surprisingly it just draws it again right there. Um, no, there isn't a function that gives you the convex, or are you just saying that's what happens? But that doesn't explain no. Um, so I think here, I don't think, so, I don't think, it, it's just, the second one's just like if you did something, it's not at all taking the convex hole, it's just, um, <coughs> So it's doing something that depends fundamentally on the order of the points, whereas the convex hole would not. And I don't know what the definition is when uh, it isn't obvious. <laughs> um, and I'm sh pretty sure it's not documented what the definition is. But. We can look. I seriously doubt it's documented. Um, it returns a polygon, Whew. depending on value of points. Great. <laughs> so 
Uh, if anybody can come up with a nice description of what it actually does, it would be a great thing to add as a paragraph right there to the documentation. I personally usually draw convex polygons. Okay, moving on. Maybe I'll put a note here. Um, uh, does anybody know what polygon actually does? <clears throat> when it's not obvious. Okay. Um, the plot command. I've mentioned this before, but it's super important to mention multiple times. So. Um, the plot command takes as input either, the first argument is either a symbolic expression, which um, you get by defining some symbolic variable like x and then <coughs> writing things like sine and cosine x and so on, or it's just an arbitrary Python function that you can call with one input, one floating point input. So um, this is an example of plotting a, you know, a certain standard sort of um, symbolic function, x cubed sine x cosine of sine of x, and there's various options that are given there. Notice, for example, that you can impact the <laughs> line style, um, the color of the line, of course, the thickness of the line, whether or not there's a fill. The line style is pretty important to know about because if you ever draw more than one plot together in the same picture, you'll probably want to change the line style um, for the other plot, especially if you're going to reproduce it somewhere where you don't get color. Um, or if you want to make your plot easy to read by somebody who is colorblind, which there are many people actually, I don't know what the proportion of colorblind people are, but um, there are a surprisingly large number of colorblind people. So not me, but um, take them into account. Right? You know the proportion of colorblind people? No? Okay. What? I'm impressed. When do we have to declare our ads? Um, this would actually be declared already by default. You don't have to do that. Um, but it's good practice, just in case you accidentally had set x equal to something earlier, you can do that. Um, it makes x a symbolic variable. You could also call it something else like y, or whatever, theta. You can call it anything, you just have to explicitly say that it's... You have, since you're about to use the variable, you have to declare it. Actually, it's maybe a little better to write y equals far of y. What that does is say, this variable called y is now a symbolic variable. and here, I have to explicitly say I want y now to vary from 0 to 20. And let me show you the other way of doing the same thing, but using a Python function, where there's no, um, say, let's just call it f, like that. I'll say return x cubed times, for example, math.sine of x times cosine math. Say I want to explicitly use um, the math functions, which might be a little faster. If I, I mean, I can't if I, I don't have to do that. Maybe that's confusing. So I'll just do it like this. So that made a standard Python function, and then we can plot that instead. And what you do here is you put f. It wouldn't make any sense to say y right there, because, um, I mean, there, the symbolic variable y isn't relevant. So in case you're just using a standard Python function, something that's callable like that, then you can just give the range of values where you want to plot. Okay, so if we plot this, it should look exactly the same. If, you, um, if you're really worried about performance, this one should actually be slightly slower than the one up there. The reason is that the one up here, it takes the symbolic expression and it compiles it into some super fast internal form that can be um, evaluated at floating point inputs highly, highly efficiently. And then it evaluates it at lots of points. Whereas this one just simply calls this symbolic, or just calls this Python function over and over again, doesn't, uh, doesn't compile it into any fast form. Um, of course, with a Python function, you can do things that you can't do with the symbolic expression. For example, if you want to be cute, you could say plus random times 0.1. And now our function will suddenly have some random value between 0 and 0.1 added to it every time it gets called. Because you can do anything. I mean, you could make the function change in various ways. So that had little effect because of that x cubed, maybe. Uh, maybe get rid of the point one. I want to have an impact. The scales. OK. You want 1,000? Okay. Oh, look, you're right. Look at the x-axis, or look at the y-axis. Aha. Crazy. 
it's hard to even see what's going on. Uh, maybe I'll do a little bit less. But it gets it gets jiggled around as a result. Um, the line style is kind of making it hard to look at, so try changing the line style and make the thickness one. Um, even with a thickness of one, what happens is it, it evaluates the function at some default number of points, which is a, maybe, I don't know what it is, somewhere around 100 or something like that. And then any time you have two points that are, as I mentioned before, um, next to each other and they differ by a lot, then it fills in extra points to try to make it smooth. Of course, if you're randomly messing it with it like this, it's going to just keep going as far as it can recursively. And then there's a parameter that determines when it gives up. And um, here, obviously, it's gone really far, um, as you can see. Actually, if we did uh, g dot show um, or save a dot svg, we could look at the svg version of this, which allows us to zoom in. Um, it's really hard to zoom in on a PNG and get anything useful. Wow, that didn't. Oh, here it is. So I should be able to just zoom in. Um, fortunately, it's moving. But as I zoom in, I can see a little bit more. Still, it's just going, basically, it's just going up and down like crazy because it's being randomly perturbed. Okay, now I will zoom out. We are. Okay, so that's that. That's done. Okay, so plot has an enormous number of options, and I'm not going to go into much more detail. As with everything else in Sage, just type plot question mark or plot open parentheses tab, and you'll see all the options. The key things to take away about plot are it has an enormous number of options. It does do adaptive refinement. It can take as input either a symbolic expression or an arbitrary Python function, and it is faster when you give it a symbolic expression as input. Okay, and you can impact the line styles. Okay, let's move on to parametric plots. So here's an example of a parametric plot. So um, there are also 3D parametric plots. We'll talk about those tomorrow. This is a 2D parametric plot. So what you do is you give the x and y coordinates as functions of some as functions of some parameter, say t here, and then you say where t should vary between. And here you are. So this gives you a little bow tie type thing. Um, these are really fun. Uh, basically, you can describe how you can imagine this as a particle tracing out some path in the plane where the point at time t is given by these x and y coordinates. Um, here, sine of t and sine of 2t. And then t is varying from time 0 to time 2 pi. Um, you can get really cool looking um, pictures if you, you know, do funny things. Um, I don't know, just do something kind of random here. See what happens. Wow, look at that. Um, or maybe, let's see. It's, it's often nice if it's periodic. Uh, or at least somewhat bounded, so there's something crazy looking. Um, probably you can set the thickness. Um, sometimes a really, if there's going to be a lot of lines on top of each other, a thin thickness is good. So there you are. That is not a, the most beautiful um, parametric plot I've ever seen, but um, maybe with maybe like that. Huh, rounding issues, I don't know. Um, I guess these are all, the period's sort of simple, so. Um, I guess that was probably the best thing to make it look kind of crazy. All right, uh, implicit plot, this is a super, super useful command to know about, and definitely, uh, I think, all the plotting functions I showed you so far were put into Sage pretty quickly, except for the function plot itself, which, um, you know, there was an initial version and it got more and more sophisticated. But the implicit plot one um, took a very long time until a reasonable version of this plot actually got into Sage. Um, for a long time, there was no implicit plot, or there were little tricks to do implicit plots that weren't very good. Um, it's pretty difficult to um, implement this, actually. So, 
I mean, the first thing is you think, oh, the way you should implement implicit plot is kind of how, you, but let me tell you what it does, by the way. It draws the zeros of this expression. You can give either a Python function f, or whatever you want to call it, or a symbolic expression, or a symbolic equality, and implicit plot will draw where that function equals zero, or that symbolic expression equals zero. So um, if you, you know, write down, I mean, this sort of comes up if you, you know, if you write down an, an equation like x squared plus 2y squared equals 3xy minus 5, then you might say, hmm, I wonder what that looks like if you draw a picture of it. And of course, if you were to do that, what you would do is probably use a little bit of um, what you learned in calculus. You do something where you figure out where, um, maybe, I mean, you have a couple of approaches. You could solve for y as a function of x and look at, you know, these two different sort of branches. And um, you, you can plot two functions and put them together. Uh, in more complicated cases, you might um, compute derivatives and see where the slope is vertical and horizontal, and that gives you a sense of what the picture looks like. So in fact, I don't know in what class, but at some point in your life, you've probably spent a lot of time trying to draw implicit plots. Is that true anymore these days? No? Oh. Well, when I was a kid, they, they made us spend an enormous amount of time taking an equation like that or something and then drawing a picture by hand. And you do all kinds of calculus to, to do it. Um, so you might be tempted when you implement implicit plot to think that you want to somehow use calculus. But um, that turns out to not be necessary at all when you have a computer at your disposal. Um, because you can just, again, um, you can compile this expression down to some form where you can evaluate it very, very quickly. And you just evaluate it at um, several hundred points in each direction and plot where it's really close to zero. And in most cases, that looks wonderful. What? How do you get the smooth? You don't. It just looks smooth. <laughs> it's really just a bunch of points. Um, and there's some algorithm that you know joins them up, so but it's... Um, I think it does, let's see, it, I mean, it's really, it, it does, so it's close to zero, so, um, close to zero is kind of a smooth condition, um, <laughs> equal to zero, maybe not so good, but close to zero tends to be, so if a point, if the, if it's close to zero at a point, it's close to zero somewhere around it, and so it kind of, it does interpolate, yes, um, I mean, really behind the scenes, what this one does is it uses uh, a, con a function called contour plot. And it just sort of specializes the parameters for contour plot to make something that looks like a good implicit plot. The key thing it relies on, though, is just evaluating whatever you give it as input at an enormous number of points, at maybe um, you know, a million points or something. Uh, you can control how many points it evaluates at by using the plot points input. So if you give or what did I do wrong here? Oh, it's that time thing again. Sorry. So here's what happens if you plot at very few points. So you can see visibly here it is interpolating a little bit. Um, I plotted at only five points in each direction. It found five points where the thing looked very, very close to zero. It just drew a line around them to make it look good. And this is what it gives us. You could also do it at 500 points. Let's see what the timing looks like for these two things. So at 500 points, takes uh, less than a second. <coughs> and at five points, it takes, I mean, it's almost no difference in time. The, it's probably spending most of the time after it's drawn the plot actually rendering the PNG image. That's by far dominating the complexity. So um, on the other hand, if you have a function f of x, y, and you've implemented it in Python, so you wrote in either Python or Cython, you wrote something like def f of x, y, and then you, uh, you know, you do a bunch, do stuff, return, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, you might write something that takes a while to evaluate. So if you use implicit plot, it could take a very long time to draw that picture because it's calling this function at every point. In that case, you should experiment starting with a small value of plot points. So it doesn't take very long, okay? All right, and uh, regarding the arguments, um, it takes a range of x values and a range of y values, or in case you are, the thing you're plotting is not a symbolic expression, just give two numbers, and they'll be the first input to the function, and two other numbers are the second input to the function. So rewriting the one down here 
as a function, which is the other thing you may need to do, um, for example like this, then the other way you would use this is as follows. And this should be slower, but again it might just be dominated by drawing the picture. But now um, we just pass in f. Something that takes two inputs, and in that case you don't explicitly say which is which. In the one below you could switch the x and the y in this input and it wouldn't matter. Up here it does matter. So let's try this one out. Um, I'll try it with time it again. So this should be a little slower in general, but let me try it with say 500 points. Let's see what happens. It appears to be slower already. So the difference between this and what we had below, which took less than a second, is purely that in the bottom one it compiles that expression before calling it. Whereas in the top one it's not doing that. It's actually making an enormous difference. I have no idea how long the top one's going to take. In fact, I've run out of patience. So I'm going to stop it. Yes? I think it just chooses five horizontally and five vertically, so a total of 25. And in the bottom, um, when you do 500, it's 500 squared points total. And notice again that it's 0.83 seconds versus 32 seconds. So there's an enormous difference between the case of a, of a function and a symbolic expression. This motivates you to want to use symbolic expressions when possible. It's not always possible. And of course there's another thing you could do, which is use Cython. And um, right here we could implement f instead using Cython. Right? Um, what you do is percent Cython, and then the inputs are doubles. And you'd want to use um, cdef extern, uh, sorry, cdef extern from math.h, double cosine double, and sine, uh, double sine double. Okay, and that would define f using Cython. Oops, did I mess up? Doubly. Doubly, oops. Messed up twice. Okay, so, and the exponent will be wrong too, right? If you star star. I think, yeah. Okay, so now let's see what happens with that. I think I'll do it with 5 first just to make sure it works. Okay, it works. Um, now I'll do it with 500. What do you think is going to happen? There, so it's actually really fast. So you can use Cython and you'll make a function that's quickly callable. You could use Python and have something that's very, very slow. Or you could use a symbolic expression. So obviously if you're writing something that can't be expressed as a symbolic expression and you really, really need it to be really fast, look into Cython. Okay? Any questions? All right? So we're doing good. So again, implicit plot's great, but it does evaluate at a large number of points, and that can take a long time. And uh, if you're, uh, here's an example of an algebraic curve, for example, um, right there. So I like algebraic curves. So there you are. Notice that you have to give the x and y range as input. It doesn't have any capability to say figure out what a nice natural choice of x and y ranges are. Um, I don't know whether, I mean, for a symbolic expression, at least it might be reasonable to come up with some algorithm that would kind of cleverly decide what the ranges should be based on, I don't know, calculus. But um, I'm not sure what that would be. Uh, if anybody wants to think about that, that might be interesting. Okay, moving on. You now know all about implicit plot. And again, um, just as parametric plot has a 3D analog, there's also a 3D analog of implicit plot, which is a whole level more difficult than 2D implicit plotting. Um, but it is in Sage. Okay, next let's look at polar plot. This is, um, I've never thought about polar plot actually. What does polar plot do? Uh, obviously it plots something in polar coordinates. Uh, Oh, I guess I don't. I don't know. I've never thought of. I've never used this. Thought about it. or looked at it before. But people teaching really like this, so they added it. What? That's a good idea. Okay, so polar plot takes a single function and plots them with polar coordinates. That I would have guessed. Um, 
Yeah, I'm a little puzzled. Seems like it, maybe you're just giving, oh. The radius is a function. So basically, it just goes around and you have to give the radius. So you could easily simulate this with, um, with a parametric plot if you knew polar coordinates. So this is a, must be a special case of parametric plot. Um, I'm guessing looking at the source code might help. Nope, because you have to look further. OK, so I think all this does is you give how far out you are as you go around the unit circle. Basically, as you go around from angle 0 through angle 2 pi. And that's what this is giving you. So for example, if we, if we just made it x, what would we see? What would this look like? A spiral, right? Let's see if we're right. Um, there we are. So it starts out really small, and it gets bigger and bigger as we go around. Um, and I'm guessing that if we were to change this to a bigger number, what, what would we see? More spiral. More spiral. Just spiral more and more, because the angle just keeps going around and around. So let's try that. Yeah. There we are. So that is what polar plot is. So if you ever want to, if you want to make yourself dizzy, you're going around and around, um, use this. So. <laughs> I'm sure we can. Minus uh, pi to whoops, that's minus, that's minus minus pi to zero maybe. Uh, yeah, I have no idea what just happened. Maybe I should turn the axes back on. Remember, it's, I'm plotting x. Maybe it's just plot 1. Yeah, so it starts out at minus pi as with radius 1 and goes all the way around back to 0. And by the way, if x is then negative, and we have spiral, r would be negative 5. But pi is negative. So what is r? Maybe this just, I don't know. That's a very good question. I guess this is going to look. This. Huh. Yeah, it flips it around. Yeah. So, so if I were to go say from zero to pi over two, it's going to go uh, along the opposite side. So it's like basically, if the radius is negative, then it just flips it around, it reflects it about the origin. Okay, so that's what polar plot does. Um, I would say the documentation doesn't really explain any of that very well, nor the examples. Again, if anyone wants to contribute to Sage, there's a great um, opportunity. OK, moving on, region plot. So this one is potentially pretty useful, especially because remember you can stack by using plus various uh, plots on top of each other. So region plot takes um, something called a symbolic expression, or sorry, a symbolic inequality, and plots um, the uh, inside and outside to it when possible. Boy, does that raise a lot of questions. Um, I haven't even mentioned symbolic inequalities before, but because we didn't really systematically go through symbolic calculus, but in Sage you can, you know, if you make some symbolic variables, you can do things like x less than y. And instead of it just immediately giving you back true or false, it holds the expression as a formal symbolic inequality. Um, you can also do things like, uh, I don't know, square root of 2 less than square root of 3. And th again, because square root of 2 is symbolic, it just holds it as a formal symbolic inequality. It always does that when the two expressions are symbolic. If you want to find out whether or not it's true or false, um, you could say bool of it. And that converts it to either true or false. It only converts it to true if Sage is absolutely certain that the thing is actually true. Otherwise, it, it turns it into false. So. It doesn't really tell you with absolute certainty whether it's true or false. But if it's true, then it's definitely true. Um, it's pretty, it does sophisticated things, like it'll simplify them using simplification rules. Um, I think it uses, it uses like a whole sequence of things. It'll use interval arithmetic. So instead of just using floats, which could be, could have rounding issues, it'll compute little intervals that, um, that if possible, so if both sides can be turned into real numbers or complex numbers, it'll compute in intervals that each of those lie in and see whether or not the entire interval for one is less than the entire interval for the other. And if not, then it'll try refining it more and more 
and at some point give up. So in fact, it, it will, it's pretty sophisticated. And if all of that fails, it'll try using maxima. And if maxima fails, then it, I think, just says false. So it does do a lot of different things. Um, and yes. Yeah, so um, OK, that's a great thing. I, it should, I think it's capable of doing that. So an example is x greater than 0. So you want to know, is that true? So it doesn't know, so it'll say false. But I can introduce an assumption, and it might uh, it might actually do something. Yes. Okay. So it does take into account assumptions. It would have not passed because variables are by default complex. Um, so if I forget the assumptions, and then say a uh, boolean x squared greater than zero. This fails, and the reason is because x could be i or something. Yeah, no, so. I, but I mean, if we have the oh, uh, I don't know if I'm not sure if that's possible. Let's see. No, no, we have the assumption that x is greater than zero, and then does the x squared. Zero. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. True. Good. Um, the assumption system is, I think, almost entirely. Uh, actually just passed through to Maxima, which is a computer algebra system. So all the rules for how assumptions work and what impact they have, if any, on symbolic variables is determined by Maxima. So um, uh, for better or worse, they may or may not have an impact on what you're doing. And how the, how the, how the zero and zero? There's a list program called Maxima, and in there they've implemented that rule in some way. Um, I don't know how it works. So, okay, so region plot, oh, sorry. Uh, I believe it does, in fact, yes. It, it does imply x is real. Um, you can also, I think, assume that x is real. Um, I, I think this is the notation for that. Yeah. Um, so obviously, now we wonder, if we assume x is real, does x squared greater than 0? So I forget, forget, forgets all assumptions. If I now assume that x is real, what happens when I do this? So that assumption, apparently that's not enough to, the maximum assumption system isn't smart enough to do that. Aha, good point. Very good point. Let's try that. Hey, look at that. It's just smarter than I am, but not smarter than you guys. OK, yes? Can you do a pool of the expression and give the value to that? Like if you had, like if you assign this expression to some other thing. Yes. Yep. Uh, you mean like, I kind of did that before. So you, can, you mean like that? So now I have something called EQN. And in fact, there's a whole bunch of things you can do with, it, with an equation. Like you can ask for the left-hand side. Um, you can like swap the inequality. You can do all kinds of things with them. You can you know, add something to both sides, et cetera, et cetera. And you can also say bool of it. And it'll turn it into either true, if it's absolutely certain it's true, or false if it doesn't really know or if it thinks it's false. Well, can you do the bool of it and then give like potential value to the x? Uh, so let's see. I mean you could just you can do subst. So given a symbolic expression, you can do um, x equals five. It just turns it into given any symbolic expression or inequality. You can call it with variable equals value, and it substitutes those in. And then you can ask for bool of the result of that. So yes. Um, you can also explicitly say subst. I've just given you kind of an overview of the symbolic functionality in Sage. Um, OK. Yeah. Maybe. Try it out for yourself. Assuming they're all real, then I think it, it would likely know that. I don't know. I'm not sure to what extent. So in general, these things are tricky and require um, implementing difficult algorithms. But and I don't know how much is implemented. Wait, actually, say the thing you said again. We can at least do a region plot. It sounds like a good example. So what is it? Uh, that's in 3D. Okay, that's in 3D. I don't want to mess with that yet for tomorrow. 
All right, I want to get through some more of the 2D before we run out of time in nine minutes. So, in fact, I want to finish 2D. And it's very important I talk about the PyLab 2D stuff more than I did last time, so I'll make sure I do by setting a timer. So that we'll definitely get to talk about that. So four more minutes of Sage's 2D, and then we'll talk about um, uh, MATLAB style 2D. Okay, so region plots, um, I mean, just for fun, let's do something crazier looking. Uh, but basically, you can describe some figure, and instead of using an equality, which will just give you the edge, you can give inequalities, and it will draw a plot. And you can say what you want the color to be, the border and the inside. So again, you can imagine how in some illustrations that would be nice to have. Okay? I have, the, uh, I have no clue how this works, um, actually. I've never used region plot before a few minutes ago. Um, I am guessing that it probably just, uh, yeah, it's probably just, I'm sure that it's just, I mean, given that it has plot points, it's undoubtedly, for this particular thing, not doing anything. This was just an aside, all this bull stuff and so on. I was just showing you how symbolic inequalities um, are surprisingly sophisticated, and they exist. Um, <clears throat> but it's just evaluating, so yeah, that massively clarifies what's going on. It's just taking this symbolic inequality, whatever it may be, putting in specific values for x and y, and then asking whether or not it's true or false. And it's doing that at 250 squared points, so a large number of points, and then where it's true, it's drawing it in one color, and where it's false, it's not drawing anything. So you could do something sophisticated here. Um, sophisticated and, you know, it's not going to have any trouble at all. So. Seems to be doing fine. It's actually pretty fun. It's pretty neat, actually. They all look really pretty. Cool. I can see why somebody added region plot. Um, okay. Moving on. Here's another example just playing around with region plot. So this is plotting everywhere where cosine of x times sine of x times y is positive, or non-negative, I should say. Okay. And this just illustrates more things like you can give a border style, um, etc. Okay. All right. Next command, list plot. Um, list plot is a lot like the um, line command, but it puts a little dot at each of the points in the list of points that you're giving. And it has, it, um, let's see, actually, sorry. It's, it also assumes the x coordinates are 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. So if you have a list of numbers, then list plot will, um, it kind of makes the plot of the function that at the value 0 is the first number, at the value 1 is the next number, and so on, with a little line between them. I'm not sure what more needs to be said. It's just, so here I did it with primes up to 30. And notice that the first point is at 2 and then at 3, and then at 5, and then at 7, and then at 11, and so on. And I did it twice. Um, the first one drew the, um, maybe I should do one at a time. Second one drew the dots, and the first one drew the line. So let me do one at a time, actually. So the first list plot is just going to draw the line that goes through 0, 2, 1, 3, 2, 5, etc. And then I added to it, the other option to list plot is that it doesn't join the points together, and in that case, it puts a big point at each point in the list plot. Okay, so list plot is yet another command that can draw a bunch of dots. Um, you could easily do the same thing using um, points or lines, or point or line, either of those commands. Um, there's another command, scatter plot, which takes points and just draws a bunch of dots. Okay, so very soon we'll move on to the matplotlib stuff. You can draw bar charts. Um, people seem to be unhappy with bar charts in Sage. It's a common source of complaints. In fact, the second I tried it out, in like 10 seconds I filed a bug report, or at least complained. Because if you do bar chart 3, 4, pi, which draws bars of heights 3, 4, and pi, it works fine. But if you do 3, 4, pi squared, it gives you an error. <laughs> yeah, that's obviously lame. Um, it should be able to draw a bar of height pi squared. So there's a bug here, obviously. Um, 
Let's see. Contour plot. That's what's illustrated here. Um, this is a contour plot. There are many, many, many possible ways to color your contour plot. So this is an example of some random function. I drew a contour plot of it. And um, these are all the different ways in which you can color your contour plot. So there are lots of different color modes, as you can see. And so when I click on one, it's changing to that mode. So there are lots and lots of different ways to draw contour plots. Contour plot actually underlies the implicit plotting functionality. Here's a density plot. Um, here is a vector field plot. So here at each point, this um, two-tuple describes a vector, and this is a plot of those vectors. Okay, so if you're ever teaching differential equations or taking it, then you might want to use plot vector field. There's plot slope field, which gives a bunch of warnings. Apparently this has been, it's a bug in uh, NumPy or something that it gives warnings. Uh, matrix plot, that's another useful function. You give it as input a matrix and one of the color maps from before, the same as the color maps for contour plot, and it draws a matrix. And you can even make the matrix very large and it will deal with that, I think, no problem. Okay? This is good if you want to visualize your matrix. And then finally, complex plot draws a plot. Um, the the uh, darkness of the plot and the Basically, the various parameters of the color give you both the um, argument and the absolute value of the complex number. So it really is genuinely giving you a four-dimensional picture in some sense. Um, and finally, graphics array. This allows you to put a whole bunch of plots together on the same page. Okay, so thus concludes the Whirlwind uh, tour of Sage plotting. And now, um, NumPy plotting, or PyLab. So PyLab allows you to plot, and it's exactly like MATLAB, or uh, almost exactly like MATLAB. I mentioned it before and even showed you this example before, but the key thing I want to do in the last, uh, I guess, one and a half minutes that I have is the following. So there's a website, which is the MATPLOTLIB website, and if you go there, you'll find it. It has lots of documentation. You don't really need to look at it too much because, again, if you know MATLAB's plotting, it's the same. But one wonderful thing they have is a gallery. And at the gallery, they give you the source code to produce any of these plots. And so you can take um, pretty much any of these and use them in Sage or modify them as you want. So as long as they don't require data files, it's pretty easy to just copy and paste them. So for example, let's take this spirally looking one. You click on it, it shows you um, what it looks like. If you click on source code, it gives you the code that generates it. And you should be able to just copy and paste it um, Wow, this looks terrifying with all these if ones. Um, I'm scared of this one, to be honest. But um, I did copy and paste a random one earlier, and here it is. I had to make one change, though. It'll say pylab.show in the examples. You have to change that to pylab.savefig in order to use it in Sage. And just to show you what you get when you run this one, and notice it, it should look very much like MATLAB here with add subplots and all this stuff. And here's the picture you get. OK? All right, so thus concludes 2D plotting. We will do 3D plotting on Friday. Yes. Yep. And we have, all, we have almost finished almost finished the project. Excellent. So all you need is some data, right? Yes. Okay. Um, well, if I don't, I will certainly do it by tomorrow because that's my office hours. If nothing else, I'll just do it right right during my office hours. So, um, but it takes a while because I have to start up something, log into something, stuff like that. But I'll, um, it will happen soon. Oh, no. By the way, no, by the way, the volatility behaves in a strange, in kind of a strange way, you know, which mm -hmm. um, because it's. Um, I would, I thought that it, I thought that it would be 